you're going to love this beautiful elegant group theory theorem that if a finite group G has an even number of elements, for example, six elements, 28 elements, 2,916 elements, not 17, um, then there is an element G in the group that's not the identity, so that G squared is equal to the identity. So of course the identity squared is the identity always, but we're saying there is a non-identity element G with square equal to the identity. We're gonna construct such a G just knowing that the number of elements is even. So let's just dive into the proof. So it's really a beautiful proof and I want you to follow along and think about what's going on. So we're going to assume for a contradiction, okay? So let us assume for a contradiction that the statement is false. That G squared is not equal to the identity for all G not equal to the identity, okay? So that's what we're going to assume, proof by contradiction. So notice the following, that saying that the square of something is the identity, saying that x squared is the identity, is the same thing, this means equivalence, okay, if and only if, is the same thing as saying that x is equal to x inverse. Because all we have to do to go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side is multiply both sides on the right by x inverse or on the left by x inverse, and vice versa, x equals x inverse, multiply both sides by x to get x squared is e. So these two statements are the same. So why am I emphasizing this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the set G minus the identity, okay? Notice that this set has an odd number of elements because G had an even number of elements. So given that, we're going to consider things of the form X, X inverse, okay? For X not equal to the identity, okay? We're going to look at these two element sets. They have two elements because we assume for a contradiction that every non-identity element, its square is not the identity. So it's not equal to its inverse, okay? So that's important. So we've got these two element sets, and now we want to show, you can sort of visualize it as such. Here's your group. You've got your x, you've got your x inverse. Uh, maybe you've got your y, you've got your y inverse. You want to show that all the non-identity elements are neatly partitioned into these two element sets, which means that we're doing rigorous math, so you have to be very precise about what we're doing. It may not be obvious, so we have to check it very carefully. So we have to show, for example, there isn't an overlap like this, okay, with another two element set of the form ZZ inverse, like this, or maybe another overlap like this, okay, where you have some W and W inverse is overlapping like that. We have to check that's not the case. So I'm gonna rigorously write that down because sometimes these things are deceptive. So you can really understand what's going on. I'm gonna do it on this side of the board. And watch till the end because I'm gonna tell you something even more that will blow your mind, super cool. Okay, so what we're going to show is the following statement. I'm gonna be very precise with the way I write this proof. We want to show that if the intersection between X, X inverse and Y, Y inverse is non-empty, okay, so it's not the empty set, then the two sets are equal, okay, so then x, x inverse and y, y inverse are equal. This is the formal statement because if you're thinking about writing a proof, you want to make that very rigorous, this is what you want to prove because basically what we're saying here is these two element sets are either disjoint or equal to each other. So in other words, they partition the non-identity elements of the group. So how do we prove this? So the proof of this subclaim, okay? You can think of this as a subclaim in the proof. Um, the proof of this subclaim is just that, let's, let's start off with the assumption, with the hypothesis. If x, x inverse intersection, y, y inverse, okay? It's going to equal to, if it's not empty, it's going to have one element. If it has two elements, then the two things have to be equal, okay? Because the intersection is a subset of both of them. So if it had two elements, it'd have to equal to both of them. Therefore, both of them are equal. So we assume it has one element, so there are two cases. Either the one element is x, which is equal to y inverse, okay? Or the one element is x, which is equal to y. Okay, so let's first consider the case where the one element is x, which is equal to y. Okay, so x here, y here. Well, in that case, of course, um, x inverse is going to equal to y inverse. So that's a bit silly, okay? So for example, you can visualize it, okay? x, x inverse, and then you're saying, okay, this is equal to y and then you have y inverse. Well, that can't happen, because if x is y, then x inverse and y inverse have to match. So that's a bit silly, so that's true. And the other case is if x is equal to y inverse is the intersection point, okay? So x equals y inverse is the intersection point. Well, in that case, then we know that x inverse is just going to equal to y inverse inverse, which is going to equal to y. Okay, so if x equals y inverse is the intersection of these two sets, again, the two sets are equal because the other element of both the sets is going to match up. 
So x inverse is going to equal to y. And to be very precise, why is y inverse inverse equal to y? That's why does it follow from the group axioms? Well, basically the reason is that because of the equation y y inverse equals y, we see that y is the inverse of y inverse. Okay, so therefore y is equal to the inverse of y inverse. So that is the uniqueness of inverses in the group, which is something that you have to prove, okay? But using the uniqueness of inverses, that's true. So that's something you have to prove. I've done it in another video. Um, links will be down in the description. So now you've got this x inverse is equal to y. So again, therefore, you can conclude the two sets are equal. So our claim is proved. And now we're done because we know that we've partitioned g minus the identity into these two element sets, all of which are disjoint or equal to each other. So therefore, we've concluded that this set has cardinality that is even. But we know by assumption that the cardinality of g is even. So one more than an even number is also even, which is impossible. So therefore, we've got our contradiction. And there must exist an element which is equal to its own inverse. That is not the identity. And two, two comments about this proof that you're going to want to know. Okay, I'm giving you some wisdom about group theory. So you can really keep this in mind. One way of proving this is by using the theory of equivalence relations, okay? So the theory of equivalence relations says the following, I'm gonna erase this here. We know that if we define an equivalence relation, x is equivalent to y, if x is equal to y, or if x is equal to y inverse, okay? This is a relation on the non-identity elements of G, and if we prove it's an equivalence relation, there is a general theory of equivalence relations that the equivalence classes have to either be disjoint or non-empty. So this is a general machine. Once you've proven that statement about equivalence relations, you don't have to keep going back and reproving these kinds of statements. So what you need to check for equivalence relations are that x is equivalent to x, which is certainly clear. You need to check that equivalence relation, this is called um, reflexivity. You need to check symmetry, which is that x is equivalent to y, if and only if y is equivalent to x. So that's kind of the reasoning we used in the proof. Okay, if you dig deep to prove this, you're kind of using a similar reasoning. Um, so this is, this is also using the inverse of the inverse gives back the original element. And then you've got x is equivalent to y plus y is equivalent to z implies that x is equivalent to z. This is transitivity of the relation. So I encourage you to check all these and drop a comment down below if you like, explaining why these things are true. Okay, I love comments and engagement really help. And please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. It really helps the algorithm to disseminate my videos to more and more people. So if you're enjoying this content, just click that button. It's all free content. And I'm just going to give you one more statement which is so beautiful. It is Cauchy's theorem. Cauchy's theorem states that if P divides the order of a group, so if you have a finite group and P divides G, the order of G where P is a prime number, then there is an element of order P in the group, okay? So then there exists, so this is the there, ex, there exists symbol, there exists a G not equal to the identity, so that G power P is equal to the identity, okay? And in fact, in this situation, P is the smallest non-negative integer, so that G power that integer is the identity, okay, in that situation. So G squared, G cubed, dot, 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 G to the P minus one are not the identity, but G to the P is the identity. And that's Cauchy's theorem that requires a much more involved proof. So if you want to see that, drop a comment down below again. And please check out my group theory playlist. It's going to pop up on the screen here. It's got all the stuff on group theory. I'm a research mathematician. I specialize in group theory. I build my own theories on groups. So specifically the break group. So what better place to learn group theory? Check out my playlist. It's growing. It'll keep growing. And if you want to see another fun video on my channel, it's going to pop up over here. There's some really beautiful applied kind of theoretical ideas in math. Check it out. It's going to pop up on the screen. And take your peek and I'll see you there. And I wish you all the best.